Today on Seeds of Gold, we visit a farm and holiday destination. Who knew? They say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. This farm and holiday destination has specialized in rearing ducks. <laughs> ducks are very popular in Asia and China, particularly has the largest population of domestic ducks. The proprietor for this farm, Mr. Bart Kakoza, yes, the journalist, decided he's going to make duck meat the in thing. His farm sits on 67 acres of land, exactly 13 kilometers from Zirowe along Zirowe Chichusa Road in a village called Masungwe. On arrival, we are welcomed by FARM, an acronym for FARM, Accommodation, Retreat and Meals. Now you know what to expect. This is literally a dream farm. This episode of Seeds of Gold is dedicated to duck rearing. Such warm birds. What a welcome. Ducks can be reared for meat and eggs. The breed on this is the Peking duck. The body shape of a Peking duck is long, fairly wide and fully breasted. The primary reason this breed is favored for meat production. The Peking ducks also lay large delicious eggs. The more reason farmers are encouraged to venture into duck rearing. They are good birds, easy to take care of with healthy white meat. Ask the Chinese, they know. Peking ducks are a delicacy in China. And they, 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 are, they are foreign here. They are not the traditional ducks that you have in your homes. These are a delicacy in all of the Eastern Far East, Far East Asia. And of course the people here take interest in, in eating them. But also in the, in the West, in Europe and America, they are quite a big delicacy. That's why you see when you visit the village, I saw a friend, she slaughters the duck for you. And duck meat is very, very tender, very delicious, doesn't have a lot of fat. It's relatively something very, very pleasant. It's white meat. Now, in the background, you can see a lot of these birds, but they are different. There is goat, geese, and ducks. Now, most people mistake ducks for geese. And I've heard people say, oh, wali wali kabata kabuzi. The by Uganda call it kabata kabuzi. These are, these are, so because for them they know such ducks which are white are supposed to be geese, but they are not. We have geese and ducks, and we have 1,300 ducks, pecking ducks. Now we were introduced to pecking duck uh, rearing about three years ago. Actually, I was introduced to. And um, because I'd already been doing chicken, kokonganda, for the past, uh, 18 years, I thought it would be good to also add ducks to, you know, to the flock. Now, in China, the pecking ducks are actually released into paddy fields where they eat the snails that would cause the, 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 the rice crop to fail. So when we started uh, doing pecking ducks over here, we had already dug our fish pond and then we thought we would bring some because we already had some already where we had where we live so we thought we'd bring a few we brought about 20 and we thought they you know really added some color to to the environment and from 20 they have since grown to 840 ducks that we have over here so now pecking ducks are very good and unique you can hear the way they cry now that noise 
drives away the, ka the, 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 the what we call the black kites or the karoli who come to steal your chicken, the, the young chicken, right? So they themselves, they know they don't, they never, never, never come and perch or have a place on this farm. Also, about three years ago, do you remember there was a time when there was the fall army worm? Especially in Luero, the caterpillars came and devastated people's gardens overnight. These pecking ducks are unique. Like I said, they sound and, and they, there's something in the atmosphere. It just chases away. We never saw any caterpillar or locusts coming to land over here. Zero. Zero. So I would encourage farmers, if you have a water source, because the ducks do need water, the water, when you see them dipping and, and diving, they're actually washing their faces. You need to clean their eyes. It's very, very important. And also to, to, to wash themselves. You will find that it has what you call a sympathetic relationship. They will help with keeping away general pests which would come and devastate your crop. Taking care of pecking ducks is very easy. They can be conditioned to a certain behavior and they follow instruction so a farmer can train them however he deems fit. Pecking ducks are quite very easy to, to rear because they eat maize bran. And if, you, if, if they eat maize bran, it's available, you can feed them like you feed chickens. They are not, uh, they don't really suffer so much from disease. But when they become many, they can certainly get sick with some illnesses, especially to do with the, the limbs. When they lack calcium, they, they, they fail to stand and they start walking wobbly and they eventually die. But they are not really... And we take care of them because we have a vet who comes in and looks after them almost maybe a monthly and that's all. But they are not difficult to wear. We, the, oh, the most important thing that they need water. And if you have water around, then they will have fun. And, uh, and then, of course, ours are conditioned in such a way that they have their houses retreat to in the evening when they have finished swimming and, and having fun outside, they stay in those houses. And in the houses, they are conditioned that at exactly 6 o'clock in the evening, the caretaker whistles, and when he whistles, each duck finds its way. They know each, each duck knows where it sleeps, so they all head for their house and they stay there. In the morning at 10 o'clock, we open for them. The farm has a man-made pond which houses both fish and birds coexisting symbiotically. Water is their source of life as they all love it. You see, do you see this, this pond here? The pond is stocked with a lot of cut fish. And then we've got also lung fish. A lung fish is a, is a cannibal. It eats other fish, it eats other things, it can eat anything. And you know, one frustrating thing is that ducks mate on water. And when they mate on water, their reproductive organ for the male, after mating, keeps dangling. So while it is dangling, the lung fish thinks it is a worm. So it, it cuts the, 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 the reproductive organ and then the duck dies. We have lost several of them. So, but then I have I have medicine for that. I always wake up one day and say, today is what is going to be Operation Langfish. So we put a very big net and we drag and get out those big langfish and we eat them. But one interesting thing about the, maybe you need, you need to know is that the ducks feed our fish which in, in, the, in the lake as well. Because when you notice that the ducks eat, feed from the shores of the pond, and when they feed, when they, pick, when they pick the food from the, from the feed trough, they go and pick some water from the pond so that they can help it go down, down it the, very easily. But in the process, the leftovers from the mouse leaves, stay in the water and the, and the catfish feeds on that. So it is a kind of a system that is complementary here. 
And like I said, we have a fantastic ecosystem going on over here. So we, we, we do not separate the chicken from the ducks or from the geese. Our farming is unique. We've had our daughter is studying veterinary medicine and she complains and says, you should keep them separately. But we said, but some of these chickens, they believe they are ducks, so they are friends. Even in the evening, you find some chickens are actually sleeping with the ducks. And that's what they've been used to since they were young. So I said, are you going to tell this chicken you run away from here? Because their friends are in this house and that's where they are comfortable to sleep. Pekins grow fast and start laying eggs when they are about 26 to 28 weeks of age and can be kept economically for about 40 weeks. If fed well, these ducks can lay between 200 and 300 large white eggs annually. This station in terms of, they are both supposed to be 33 days, 32, 33 days. But ours, a pecking duck never sits on eggs. They just lay eggs and then we take them for incubation. So we take them for incubation and we incubate them and bring back the ducklings and they will grow them here. They, they relatively, they basically don't sit on eggs. We will go for a short commercial break and when we return, Bart shares his inspiration. to note that baking ducks do not need harsh sunshine. You only have to keep them under the shade. You know they don't like the sun so much. As you can see, they always tend to follow them. But when they are on the water, it's okay. But they don't like the sun because I think the sun, a lot of heat causes them trouble. That's why you see in their houses, they are properly rated. That's it. But basically, I look after them like that and you... They are very good. People, we sell them. We People come to buy them for meat. Others just for prosthetic purposes, they want to look at them because most people like looking at them and they are such relaxing sight that when you are here, you can actually stop your get rid of your stress by sitting and looking at them swimming. These ducks do well in a home for beauty and this was initially the idea on this farm. However, as time went by, the market paved way for itself and thus the increase in numbers. As we speak, it has proved to be one of the lucrative money-making ventures. Our farm is by the roadside. And when we established this farm, we wanted to have pecking ducks. Because I've traveled in the Far East and America and I've seen people keep them for, for just specific purposes. We look at them when we establish them. We just wanted to have our ducks. There would be a few of them, like was about 20 and looked at them and they're relaxing. We didn't have this idea of say, let's start for purposes of selling and making money from them. But then with time, people started saying, oh, the Chinese like ducks. But it's not only Chinese, people like ducks, if you can. Have. So they started coming to buy. The local people come to buy, the uh, Ugandans and the local people come to buy ducks, to keep open out, start up their own farms to also to have them. But there are also those who, who come to buy for, for meat. We sell our duck 100,000 shillings each. Yeah. So you can come if you have your 100,000, you take it. If you want to eat at a, a, a goose, a goose is slightly expensive. But you'd wonder why would you want to eat a goose? Because it's very expensive. And the goose is 250,000 shillings. If you are buying them to keep them at home for, for purposes of. Um, of security for, for for keeping your farm secure because for us we use them as as carries here then you need to have to start with a pair because you don't buy one they always sold in pairs so a pair is five hundred thousand and then you can go and start if we had many people who are keeping these ducks would actually develop a market and that market would be exploited which is not there so we are asking people, please, let's get into taking ducks 
and develop, develop the market. So that if, if the Chinese girl came today and said he wants a thousand ducks, we'd be able to get, go to Bat's farm, go to Rosemary's farm and pick 500. And then we're able to supply at least every week, supply about 500 ducks. And that's a lot of money as opposed to the chicken, which may not even fetch you much more money. Than that. When you step on this farm, nature welcomes you. It is a very good reminder of our African home setting. What inspires Bart to keep the environment as is, yet set up such beauty? I grew up in the village, I didn't grow up in the, in the, in the town, I grew up in the village deep there. And I saw my mother keep uh, five chickens and I grew up looking after five chickens. Then we had our cows, we had our goats, and I saw the goats grow up. So I kind of developed some kind of affinity to the animals. And then uh, I love animals, especially these domestic animals, especially goats and cows and all these. I think in life, these, these are part of life, so I, I want to associate myself with them. And that's why I don't eat meat. That's why, that's why I don't eat the chicken, I don't eat these birds. Uh, because at the age of 13, I was a young boy. I had a, a goat and my goat was slaughtered. And when it was slaughtered, they, they brought it for, they had it for lunch. And when they brought it on the plate, I could see my goat. I was so horrified. Then I saw the head which had been taken, put behind the cooking stove and kept staring at me and saying, you betrayed me, they have killed me. So I said, okay, I'm not going to eat meat. So from, from the age of 13, I said, I will not. And I've lived without eating meat and I'm here. We have avoided keeping animals in captivity because we think it's cool. That's why you see we have birds that are free range because we wake up in the morning and we open for the birds and they go looking for worms, they go looking for grasshoppers and they feed and they come back. Some of them even lay eggs in the bush and they sit on their, their, egg, their eggs and hatch their chicks and that's how they are. So it's, it's, we are trying to create a kind of a traditional animal welfare keeping uh, system that, that, that you find animals are supposed to be free and they are free here. Challenges are part of life and always come in to push us beyond our limits. This farm too has its unique challenges. Power is one of them. No, 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 we don't have an incubator here. We have an incubator in Kampala, so we always carry the eggs back in Kampala. Because we don't have electricity here and we would rather do use umeme. Here we've cried for electricity but nobody has ever come to our rescue. Electricity falls past here but we've gone to umeme, we've gone to Rea, we've gone all over the world looking for, for power and they have failed to give us power. So we said okay. If they, then that one time they said oh bring 15 million things we give you an, an uh, a transformer. I said no I'm not into the habit of uh, of bribing, I'm not going to bribe. If somebody, someone gets some sense in his or her head that these guys must be providing employment for the villagers, yeah, they are doing something, let's, let's come and give them electricity. If they don't, I'll still use my solar and I'll do my things. But it's so frustrating that we have people in the Ministry of Energy, someone starts a project like this and you don't give him electricity. That's very sad and frustrating. This farm is located in a low-lying area and there has been a lot of work done to turn it into this admirable retreat. Water is what can never miss on any farm, but has devised means of smartly diverting the water into the respectable plant areas like the pond, the tanks, the drainages, all while keeping nature intact. In addition, he has put a borehole on the farm to supplement the already existing water sources. It takes good planning to achieve all this. And there is the arm of River Mayanja, which is to pass here and go around along, I mean, it circumvents this part of land. So what we did, we, we tapped into that river 
and created a pond. We used a system whereby the water would fill the pond and go back and then finds, goes back into its way and then continues along the way. So that's what we did. And then of course this water is strictly for the birds, it's not for irrigation. But for irrigation we have, we, we have a borehole which pumps water from about 75 meters deep underground and it's done by solar. So it is automatic. As long as the sun is there, it can pump and flood the whole of this area. But essentially, it, it, it pumps water from underground, brings it into those tanks you see there. The 20,000 liter tanks, tanks. And then they supply the rest of the houses here. And also, it gets our coffee because we take it by gravity down to coffee. And that's how we manage the water. Even during the dry spell, we would still have our water being pumped from underground. Interacting with his family is very fulfilling and there is much to learn. But shares his advice to fellow Ugandans. Also, he encourages people to get into duck keeping. If somebody was hungry, you'd go and climb the mango tree and it goes on the road the way and nobody's going to stop you. And you can survive. And there is everything. The soils are good. The, the, the climate is excellent, we are on the equator, so you can get anything. So as a result, most of us don't think beyond what we think. We always think, take everything for granted. And so as a result, we don't labor to think so much as what. To do. When we bought this land, somebody who sold it to us said, oh, this place floods, so we cannot have it. So we just said, okay, why wouldn't we create channels for the water so that we give it space and continues along the street without disturbing the ecosystem around. And we did that and then we are able to grow in the world. So so you have and then of course most of the flooded area is usually carry usually has a lot of good soil so you can take care of your soil and grow whatever you want without disturbing the ecosystem that is around. Most Ugandans look at farming as oh when you are in Kampala your friends will tell you have you started putting all the money? Have you started making money? <laughs> but that's, we, I am farming for posterity, for my retirement. Because if you make money and you raise some money, you, just, you need to put it somewhere. Because you are going to reach a time when you won't be able to walk. You will get a time when you won't be able So where are you going to be? You want to stay in Kampala and look at the building? Yes, it's true that when you put money in, in farming, it's not going to come tomorrow. You know, you know you to have it quickly. But if you are foresighted, you say, okay, I'm going, this will help me in my future time, in future time when, I'm, when I'm not able to make money. But also, the other thing that I've seen with us Ugandans is that every time you, they see something, they are used to growing matoke, grow matoke, but why? <laughs> like someone comes and grows matoke in Kampala, around in, in Wakiso area here. But the man in Vunyaruguru, Shema and Igara has Matoke, they grow without the labor there. You cannot compete with him. So you are just going, and you go in the market, this person comes and floods the market, and you just say, but everyone will tell you I'm growing Matoke, it's useless. There are other things you can grow, like you say, let me grow Gonja. If Gonja is, is gold, if you say I'm going to grow Sky in this, they are looking for this to export. When we did this, this dark, someone said, ah, where are you going? Are you getting that? It's not about market. Somehow, about six, six, three weeks ago, somebody came and wanted to buy six ducks. And that was six million shillings. But it is something that you buy, you, 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 you get into and say, okay, me, I know one time I'm going to make money. Let, let me give you a classic example. If I had my five acres of land, and I don't have the so-called capital, but I'm able to raise about 200,000 shillings. With 200,000 shillings, I should be able to buy eucalyptus. Eucalyptus seedlings and plant eucalyptus. Eucalyptus only needs to maintain it for the first six months and that's after it you look after itself. Now one eucalyptus tree after two years you'll be able to save 20,000 shillings. So if you have a thousand eucalyptus you're actually 20 million. Right? The African brains we use almost a, a half a quarter of what our brains are able to do by the time we die it's because everything is in our head and we can't. Yeah. The future for this farm is well defined and there is no room for mistakes. 
the accommodation, meals and retreat is underway and very promising as you can see the structures on the farm. Indeed, this promises to be one-stop center for agritourism in the near future. We will continue to bring you details of what this farm has to offer in our subsequent episodes. We are actually planning to have, uh, if we get ma many more, we want to have an abattoir. Well, we won't be dressing our, our bodies, then we, we have a refrigerated truck and we can deliver to your home if you want. We are also putting up a, a small food to go by the roadside, so that when you want a duck, you give us a call and say, I'm going to be passing along Chusa Road in 10 minutes. Can you prepare for me a duck? You just do that and you'll find it ready. It's all interesting that we, we need to exploit our, 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 our capacity to do things properly.